Hey everybody, on the phone and on the WebEx, this is JC from HISC. Uh, thank you all for joining our, I believe this is the eighth HISC brown bag. Um, today we have two awesome presenters from Bishop Museum. We have Dr. Noreen Young and Dr. Kenneth Hayes, and they're going to be presenting on invasive land snails and rat lungworm intermediate hosts in Hawaii. So uh, thanks again for tuning in, and I will turn it over to you guys. Well, hello everyone. This is uh, Ken Hayes, um, Bishop Museum at Howard University. Um, if you, at any moment, you know, while we're talking, if you have any questions or you can't hear me or hear Noreen, just let us know. You want to say hi? Hi, everybody. So we're going to break this up into two parts. We usually tag team this talk um, and switch it off and back and forth. Which part? Who gives what? Um, so I'm going to start us off with uh, the invasive land snail aspect of it. Um, and but I'm going to start off with um, not only do we like to come and give these talks at, at HISC but um, all over the place and one of our main goals in giving these kinds of talks is one to sort of convey the latest information that we have and the research that we've been doing um, to get the information out there so that it can be used in conservation public health safety all different aspects that it's useful for but also um, to get a sort of broader educational platform and help sort of um, alleviate some of the misconceptions right that are out there among some of these things so we work with a group snails uh, mollusk in general but invertebrates in general I think um, is probably the case people don't know very much about them from sort of a detail standpoint and there's a lot of misconceptions of their biology and those kinds of things. Then when you throw in the disease ecology aspect and how they're related to that, there becomes even more confusion. And that can lead to um, some difficulties in controlling them and really understanding their spread and the real threats to these things and to human health and agriculture. So that's one of our big missions. And so one of the first things I'd like to, to, to do is, is really talk about um, sort of understanding what we mean when we say snails versus a slug. Um, so first I want to ask you a question. So we're going to poll you guys. Are flightless birds still birds? In other words, from a taxonomic standpoint or from a monophyletic standpoint, you know, meaning that their individuals are more closely related to one another than they are to anything else, are flightless birds still birds? In other words, would you call a flightless bird a bird? Right? Yeah, I think nobody has a problem with that. We get that, that flightless birds are still birds. And if we just look, right? at uh, a phylogeny, a most recent phylogeny of uh, flight or birds in general, large phylogeny published in 2015 with genomic data. And what we'll see is when we look at that, we'll see that flightlessness, that characteristic, that behavior um, has evolved multiple times throughout the AVs, the group that we consider birds. So we're all familiar with ratites, you know, things like kiwis and ostriches. Uh, we think of also the dodo and I want to note that the colored boxes around each of the pictures correspond to the clades that each of these birds belong to so what you'll see is just graphically looking at this there is no one unique group that consists of flightless birds in other words flightless birds don't uh, produce a monophyletic group in other words they didn't evolve from a single common ancestor so it's not that underlying characteristics, while it helps us understand, oh, this ostriches are flightless, is flightless and so are dodos, it doesn't um, belie any underlying biology other than just how they get around and how they move. So it doesn't tell us about their physiology, it doesn't tell us about their common ancestry, it doesn't tell us about their evolutionary history, it doesn't tell us much of anything. And that's really problematic if we want to understand, you know, say bird physiology or bird diseases or their evolution, right? So it's sort of misleading. And so we consider these all AVs and then we break them up in groups based on their relationships. So along that same line, are slugs snails? Any Maybe guesses? Maybe if we call them sure. shellless snails. <laughs> okay, so slugs, shellless snails, right? So yeah, so that's essentially the same idea, right? So this over here on the left-hand side is a uh, partial phylogeny of gastropods. So there are way more snails than there are birds, and we'd never fit a 
the families of snails on here because it, it's massive. So this is a partial phylogeny. This is actually a phylogeny put together by our colleague uh, Janie Kim dealing with rat lungworm stuff and uh, we'll show you that later but I've kind of modified it just to sort of illustrate this point. The stars indicate families throughout this phylogeny that contain slugs if you will, shellless snails. And the thing is is that this is a completely shellless snail here, what most people would call a slug. The difficulty becomes is like when does it go from this to this because this is sort of really small shell and then this one's an even smaller shell. So is this a slug or is it a semi-slug? Or is this a semi-slug and that's a slug and that's a snail? The point I'm trying to make is that it becomes really confusing, right? When someone says, oh, I have a semi-slug in my yard or I have a slug in my yard. We don't know exactly what they mean. And so for clarity purposes, we prefer to just use the term snail, right? And then we can describe a snail based on other characteristics. And so we want to get that definition out there because throughout we're going to, I may slip up and say slugs every once in a while because we've gotten so much into the habit, but it really is a thing that we try to avoid because for me, it's like saying ostriches and birds. So, or chickens and birds, right? The, it, it's redundant, right? Slugs and snails. It's like saying snails and snails. So. And so this is also really important when we are trying to control invasive snails. When they're saying, oh, we have slugs, we can um, put out sluggo, it's not going to kill our native snails. And that is a big error because the things you deploy as slugicide is a molluscicide. It will kill our native snails also. That's important because calling something a snail underlies the fact that if you go all the way back here, they share a common ancestor, right? So they have common physiological features, common metabolic rates. They share common ancestors throughout their 500 million year history. So there's some commonalities that they share. Whereas if you say slugs, there are no com commonalities that we can use to define a slug that, other than the fact that they're snails. So um, again, just for clarity purposes, just so we all know what we're talking about. So what we want to talk about today really is invasive snails right? and how they get to Hawaii. And this video here really, I think, illustrates one of the major problems we have along with this uh, information from this paper here. And what we've seen you know, since 1500 is a dramatic increase in the transport of goods and services or goods and products around the globe. And this is a, a modern, I think this is from 2014. This is 24 <coughs> hours of uh, boat transport. Right? Um, sped up, obviously, very short time span, but it's incredible the amount of things we move uh, among ports. It's, it's amazing that we just don't have, we're not overrun with invasives everywhere because um, it's just an incredible vil video. And it makes the point that what we see is as that transport of, of goods and services, or goods get transported increases from about 1970 onward, the same trend from about 1500s, we see the increase in non-native plants, invertebrates, and mammals increasing along with it. So we see this sort of uh, rapidly increasing rate of introduction in invasive species with globalization. But why do things get introduced? Well, one of the ones that most readily comes to mind is int intentional introductions. They come in as food, obviously. People like to eat escargot. Um, aesthetics. Um, some people just like snails. They think they're really beautiful. I, I kind of agree with them, but I don't want to introduce them around the world. Um, religious and cultural practices. One of the reasons uh, African snails were more recently introduced back to Florida was because of a religious group brought them in for religious practices, the Santorini. Um, obviously people, there's a big pet trade for things like African snails. Medicinal purposes um, in that category will, will put cosmetic, I guess. I guess that maybe that falls under human aesthetics. There's this trend now. Um, it started really, I guess, in Asia mostly, um, but now it's in Italy, and this is an image from Italy of having spa treatments where you allow snails to crawl on your face and your body, and presumably the mucus um, makes your skin soft, which is, from a biological standpoint, is ridiculous, um, <laughs> because if your skin were that permeable, you'd have real problems. But from a, a, a human health and sanitation standpoint, it's probably it's really scary because these things carry a lot of nasty stuff that you probably don't want crawling on your face. Uh, although they claim to uh, keep them happy and clean. I don't know how you do that. I think it's just full of mucus. Um, obviously, biological control. Uh, you know, the story of Euglandina here in Hawaii is the classic example of that gone horribly, horribly wrong. 
And then there's this one that we always like to mention, right? There, this has a long history in North America anyway of Europeans wanting to make North America look like Europe by bringing plants and animals that reminded them of home. So we've got a lot of things like America, the, the sparrow uh, is one example, but we've got tons of stuff. And Hawaii, same thing. Right. But the bigger issue nowadays, I think, is probably these unintentional introductions, things that we don't want to see coming in and we're not purposely introducing but are being snuck in um, with other products. And I think that's probably by and far the largest source of these um, introductions right now. And agriculture and horticultural products top the list right, by a large margin. The other uh, items that they come in with, commercial shipments of other commodities, these include things like household goods, but also one of the biggest ones in that category are tiles, right? things we get from like natural tiles from the Mediterranean, areas like that. And that's the re because of the way they're handled, right? The tiles are uh, mined, uh, shaped, and then stacked onto pallets and set near a dock for days, maybe months. And these tiles are nice, cool, lots of limestone in them, rock snails crawl up under there and they hunker down in it because it's cool and moist and keeps them out of the sun. And then you put that pallet on a ship and lo and behold, it's in Hawaii and all over the place. So that's a big one. But vehicles, airplanes, the military seeing this now. So we've been in Iraq, Afghanistan for you know a decade and a half or more. And they've had containers sitting on the ground there that house military equipment. Now that's being packed up, put on ships, flown back to the US, dropped off in a base yard, and then snails and lots of other things crawl out of these containers that have been there. And so we're starting to see snails from regions of the world that we've never seen them from before. USDA is capturing them all the time. And so this is going to be an increasing problem. And then, of course, soil, right? So a little tiny snail like this, these things in here in these potted plants, but they also lay their eggs in these things. And we, um, they get uh, transported around without us noticing. Right? And if we just look at the data for um, the U.S. up to about 20, 2000, so 1984 to 2000, so this is from McCullough et al. 2006, um, looking at pathways associated with introduced mollusk <laughs> interceptions at U.S. ports. And what we see is that, again, bulbs, cut flowers, cuttings, fruit, plants, seeds, soil, all of those things associated with the horticultural industry and agriculture lead the top of the list. I mean, they count for 40% of all other introductions. And then they're even including here baggage. This is like uh, people coming back from vacation, things in their bags. And those are sometimes even unintentional. They're not always transporting them around. But this other is a wide variety of things. But 40% of this is just uh, horticultural, agricultural products being brought in. And you can see it's pretty obvious when something this size, I mean, this is a big snail, it could be six, seven centimeters, um, you know, pretty easy to detect. But these things right here, these are eggs of a slug. Um, they can be buried in soil, attached to the bottom of pieces of wood. You might never ever <coughs> see these. And this is probably a big uh, pathway of introduction is bringing in their eggs that um, people don't notice and don't even know what to look for most of the time. That same data, if we break it down by the region of the world where they're coming from, well, if you go back to that second slide or that first slide on transport, they're coming from all over the world, right? If you just look at where products come from um, and the ports they come into, you can sort of guess where everything's coming from. And so if you look at this, you know, we get a ton of stuff from Europe. You know, almost 60% of our trade is with Europe, and that's where most things are coming in, but they do come from all over the world. And what's interesting, you know, sort of tying this to the rat lungworm, so this is Angestrongylus uh, continensis is the parasite that causes the rat lungworm. And 36.5% of the regions that are listed here contain or have known infections of Angestrongylus. So we're bringing more and more of those vectors in. And it's an ongoing thing here in Hawaii. I mean, one of the, the examples we always like to share are the Christmas trees. Every year around a couple weeks before uh, Thanksgiving we get a call usually oh we've got some more Christmas trees in and we've shaken them or banged them and these things have fallen out. Can you identify them and tell us whether they're already established here or not? Um, and most of the time they're not established here yet, or at least many of them, simply because they're uh, temperate Pacific Northwestern things um, that we have yet to get established. Sometimes we find established ones because we have a few of those. But this is an ongoing problem every year. <clears throat> but not just Christmas trees and other inadvertent places that we may not even think to look that slip by quarantine. Obviously, the tr Christmas trees are coming in big uh, shipping containers, and we know we're inspecting those at least somewhat. But here's some cuttings you know, that came into 
Oahu from Texas um, around Valentine's Day. So they're obviously roses. And this is Cornu aspersum, the brown garden snail. It's currently only established on Maui in uh, the Makavao area. And then um, even out to Hana. It's in Hana. Did we find it in Hana? Mm -hmm. No, not really. I think it's primarily in Makavao area. But then also in Waimea on the Big Island. So those are the only places it's established. But here it is being found on Oahu at a Safeway. <laughs> Right. So luckily they, they contacted us and we got the information. They said, nope, make sure you kill them and it isn't known to be established. Now, in the low elevations, it's probably not a problem, but it's if it gets higher elevations where it's cool enough for this to survive, it can be a problem. And then these have also been intercepted on fencing shipments from Hawaii to Oahu, so stuff coming from the Big Island. And again, this is a matter of how people are handling the materials they're shipping around. That fencing material sits on the ground. Again, it provides a nice, cool, damp area for snails to hide. Then they throw it on a helicopter or throw it on a plane and it, or a boat, and it gets shipped over to Oahu or other places. And then wherever it's sat down, the snails crawl out. So to get a grip on this, like I said, we oftentimes, for a number of years, would get calls, oh, we found this snail or this slug um, on a shipment or on some plants. Can you identify it? And more importantly, can you tell us whether or not it's established in the islands already? So in 2003, four, uh, we were getting these calls a lot and we could say, okay, we can identify it, but we can't tell you whether it's established because nobody's looked for a really long time in Hawaii. Nobody's bothered to do surveys. So we convinced the USDA to give us some money to look. Um, for about five years, we targeted a number of different places, starting with horticultural facilities, primarily below 500 meters in elevation. And it, that'll become obvious why that cutoff point is in a little bit. And so these were primary nurseries and farms. From that, we convinced them that, okay, if you really want to know it's established, you can't just stick with nurseries because there are things that escape from the nurseries and outside the farms that get into our low elevation habitats and may act as a reservoir to feed back into nurseries and we may not pick them up. So we did disturbed habitats below 500 meters. We extended that to natural areas, areas that had still some natural vegetation, um, that were above 500 meters uh, th that potentially threatened with invasion. And then when the USDA said, you know, guys, this really isn't our, our job to be funding natural area studies, um, which was we were trying to sort of convince them that, oh, you should let us do this. Um, we then got one final year of funding and said, okay, well, at least let us survey for the horticultural facilities above 500 meters that may act as reservoirs for pumping them back out into the native habitats. Um, and so that's what we did over that five year period. And those are the kind of data I want to share with you now. And that was statewide? That was statewide. It was on all the main Hawaiian islands. The, the six largest. The six largest main yeah. Hawaiian islands, I should say. So it didn't include... Um, the whole of it and Or Nihau. Nihau, right. Yeah. Okay. So the facility surveyed... Um, we surveyed 62 different facilities, right? Um, and there so were... So this doesn't include all of the sites that were um, in the... Disturbed habitats, so that equal to about almost 300. Sites. Yeah, so it was about 300 yeah. locations around all the islands that we surveyed, but just the facilities surveyed, and that's what we're focusing on now. This is just the nurseries, where there were 62 of them. Um, we recorded 41 different species. Um, there were between one and 17 species at each facility, so the cleanest ones had one. Uh, the most sort of heavily contaminated had as many as 17. We recorded six new. Eight. Uh, I'm sorry, eight new records, right? In other words, species that had never been recorded in the islands before. Right? Um, and then we recorded uh, species, new species, island records um, on for 27 uh, of these sites. And this included 17 species, right? So there were 27 new island records with 17 species. So this is a lot of new data just in a very short period of time. Um, basically, it stems from they're just probably being there, um, just nobody looking. And this went up to 2009. And um, so we added to this. So this has been an ongoing tally that started with Rob Cowie when he first came to the Bishop Museum and continued when he was at UH. And then Nori and I have picked it up with the survey since uh, 2004 and then Nori joining the crew in 2007. And what you'll see is that obviously there are way more introductions, right? These are sort of reported from quarantine inspections or one-off introductions, things like that, that we don't know of as being established. But this brings the total right now to 45. And if you look at this curve, this graph, it looks very similar to the one that Hume et al. showed you in the other slide. It's really heavily related to human transport. It really is. The more stuff coming in, the more invasives we're likely to get. And 
the, the higher the propagule pressure, in other words, the more species we introduce, the more are likely to establish. It's only a fraction, but it's still a pretty good fraction that's been introduced. Okay? And again, the same pattern that held for the mainland holds for Hawaii. We're getting things from everywhere. Right? They're Holo Arctic, European, New World. Some we don't know that have sort of unknown provenances. We don't know exactly where they came from. But we get a lot more from Southeast Asia. We do. Mm -hmm. We get a ton from Southeast Asia. Right. And many of these species, right? are already known to be huge pest globally. We know they're a serious problem. A number of them make the list of 100 of the world's worst invasive species. Things like uh, apple snails, this is a freshwater snail, Pomacea canaliculata. Of course, Lasaca tinafulica, the giant African snail, and euglandina. But there are a number of these that, outside of snails, like crazy ants, things like that, that also get here, flatworms, um, things like that that come in this. So probably nothing new to this group for sure. But what I want to highlight is that if we take a recent assessment by Rob Cowie, Rob Dillon, and others, including David Robinson, um, who's the malacologist at, at APHIS with USDA, they looked at sort of globally, or rather in the United States, uh, a risk assessment of uh, invasives, so these non-marine snails um, that are priority for quarantine importance. And what it turns out is if you look at that list that they compiled based on all these criteria, that we already have 22% of them in Hawaii. And that's incredible considering such a small land area, right? That we have so many of those already. And many of these get still introduced um, quite frequently and get stopped, um, fortunately, uh, by quarantine or just don't establish. But you can see the point is, is that we're continually getting bombarded with uh, different species that we don't already have. And there needs to be some vigilance in sort of trying to keep this from um, sort of increasing what we already have here. And hopefully tying that together with what Nori's gonna talk about with the rat lungworm, it'll be really clear why we have to stop this. Just to kind of give you a sense of what the data parse out like and give you a reason why there was that 500 meter elevation cutoff, that's because we see two different cohorts of snails that get introduced into Hawaii and become established. It used to be said, a lot of times people would say, oh, well, don't worry about the temperate stuff. When it gets here, it's never going to establish because it's too hot. Well, the reality is, is temperate things, particularly if they're coming from Europe, can withstand extreme heat and extreme cold. Right? They can deal with the heat fairly well. Snails are really good at this estivating. And what we see is we see a subset that are in low elevation, right? and then a subset that are only found in high elevation. There's a little bit of overlap right, between these two groups, but these roughly break out into tropical and non-tropical species. And so temperate species, these non-tropical things, actually are a real problem and probably the greater threat. So the tropical things, look at that, below 500 meters, there's very few of them that get above <coughs> 500 meters in elevation. But these non-tropical things, they're really widespread. Many of them, many that are the most threatening to our native ecosystems are from sea level all the way up to the highest elevations that we surveyed at that time. And some of the most damaging, the ones that are considered the biggest threats and the most widespread include a couple of temperate species, non-tropical, as well as some of the tropical things. And so in total, like I said, we have 45 introduced non-marine snails in Hawaii. And pretty much uh, this term invasive, people often think of it in terms of something that causes some either agricultural or environmental impact or causes some cost, incurs some cost. I would argue that all of these things, all 45 of them are invasive just simply because we don't necessarily know what their impact might be because we haven't measured it doesn't mean they're not causing an impact. And the fact that so many of them probably can carry rat lungworm is probably a good reason to consider them all invasive anyway. Some of them we're never gonna do anything about. Subulinids, there's six species, this thing right here. They're so widespread in the world, they're everywhere. What they do in terms of damage, we don't really know. We know they carry rat lungworm, but we also don't know what they do. They're mostly found in the soils and at the root 
we think they might be chewing on roots sometimes, but they're probably eating lots of fungus and detritus as well. Well, they're definitely a food source for you, Landy and Rosea, because there, um, there was an individual of the rosy bulbs now that we dissected, and there are how many subulanids in the stomach? 52. 52. Mm -hmm. So even though they may n not have an agricultural issue that we know of, it is a food source for our invasive carnivorous snails. Right. So that brings sort of the wrap up the end of what the message that we want to convey from my part of the talk and that is is that the importance of identifying these things correctly the use of accurate taxonomy which is where we started and then the value of natural history collections so natural history collections across the globe are sort of under attack uh, being defunded uh, the National Museum of Natural History in Rio de Janeiro was closed last year because of funding because they didn't see any point in it uh, the Field Museum is always in Chicago is always under threat of being closed because the broader audience, uh, the broader audience uh, or broader public doesn't see the value in that, and I we really want to highlight that aspect. So from two examples, so this is Euglandina rosea, the rosy wolf snail, um, and it was assumed there was a single species introduced to Hawaii back in the 1950s to control the African snail. Turns out, not only was it a horrible idea from a biological control perspective, it was poorly done from a taxonomic perspective. Turns out our study that we just recently published, turns out there are two species here in Hawaii that are easily morphologically differentiated, um, and neither one of them is Euclandina rosea. Oh. <laughs> so that's problematic. And what's even more problematic, if you look at this phylogeny here, all of these branches in between, are other species of Euglandina that are undescribed. Right? So we have our Hawaii things right, in two different clades that are really different evolutionarily. What this signals is they're probably biologically different. They may have different behaviors, different ecologies. And that might be one explanation of, well, we brought Euglandina in because it wouldn't climb trees. Well, guess what? Some of these things climb trees. And we don't know yet whether there's a tree climbing one here and a non-tree climbing one. We don't know that yet, but this is the reason taxonomy is so important. The other one, it helps us clarify what we're really dealing with. There was a lot of confusion over Varanocelids in Hawaii for a long time. There was thought to be either three or four species, um, and lots of them were misidentified based on just external morphology. So our colleague, uh, Janie Kim, along with us, undertook a study to look at identification and really look at the historical ranges. And in both of these cases, Museum collections were critical. We never would have been able to assess most of this without these museum collections, to be able to understand the historical introductions, or even to be able to clarify what this is or what these are. Because museums house type specimens, type material that defines the species. And so I just want to pitch that out there, right? Because it's really important. What do we need to do? So we've got all of these problems. We've got these things coming in constantly. What do we need to do to stem the tide control the spread of these things and sort of protect both our uh, agriculture, horticultural trade, our natural systems, um, and public health. Well, we have to have ongoing monitoring, and this is a big one. So we haven't been funded to do um, statewide surveys uh, for almost, 10 years. almost a decade now. So we've got another decade gone where things aren't being found. And we know this because we've gotten small pots of money or we've done casual surveys on our own along with our Hawaiian land snail surveys. And we've found these things right here. So this was only on a couple islands. It was, this is Cyclotropus, not very widespread um, at one point. Now it's on pretty much everywhere we go. It's yeah, we just went um, to do a survey, uh, two surveys on Maui and on a big island. And they were pretty much following every single facility that we surveyed. Yeah. And this is another one. This was originally described or discovered in 2004 on it, um, in Waimanalo. Uh, it was then later found in Manoa a couple years later. And now we've just found it on the Big Island and Maui. And Maui. Yeah. So these things are spreading and no one's aware of it because we're not doing ongoing survey. The other thing is training. This is a big part of what we do. We offer workshops. We try to put these things together to provide training not only to sort of quarantine specialists, but people working in the field doing conservation. All of these aspects, because you're already in the field, you're already dealing with these products, trying to get training in identifying these things so that you can tell that this is not a, a native species. Most people wouldn't know this because it looks very similar to some of the small native species we have. And then outreach and education that's coupled with that. So we do a lot of this. and. 
um, this requires a lot of funding. So one of the things we've really been trying to push lately is to get this ID guide out there, the 45 species we have, so that um, if that information is available to quarantine inspectors, field uh, staff, things like that, they can actually identify when we have, when they find something that's not already here, right? and whether or not to take action or whether it's a threat. Right? So these are the kind of things we really need to push for more so, not just with snails, but with a lot of the invasive species. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Nori okay. and talk about even scarier stuff. Yeah, and it's a perfect topic for uh, lunchtime too, right? Yeah. So how many of you guys are eating salads today, right now? I left Max, I don't know. Nobody? Okay. Okay, so let's go on. So um, invasive moths are not just um, a threat to um, our ecosystem and um, our native plants, but they are vectors of diseases. Uh, so for today, we're going to be talking about angiostrongyles, the aces, but they also carry other types of human and livestock diseases, and they can um, give diseases to our native and other invasive species too, to keep a reservoir in a population. Another thing is, you know, we're having a, um, a large um, problem with mosquitoes, right? So on the upper left, you see a, um, a, a picture of dead shells along roadside in Barbados. So those are all giant African snails, which can get pretty large, you know, some almost to about half a foot or, or no, close to a foot sometimes. And so if you have a whole bunch of dead shells and then it rains, fills up all of these shells with water, they are great for mosquito bath larvae, right? Um, so that's a that's a, a huge huge problem, um, or it can be a huge problem. Uh, they also carry pa plant pathogens. For example, the tobacco mosaic virus. Um, here is a article in 2015 that shows that um, you know it can survive the gut of snails, and so the snails can be transporting them to different areas. So there's a whole um, area of um, pathogens as well as diseases that snails can carry that we have no clue about. So this is a hot topic as well as research that we really need to get a hold of because, you know, with the Rapidohia death and some other things like that, maybe these snails are carrying them in their mucus or in their bodies, and then once they get out into the native forest, maybe they're the ones who are spreading it also. You know, what's most important about that, I think, is not so much that we're worried about tobacco mosaic virus, I don't think we do too much tobacco farming here, but, but the fact that a slug like that can pass that um, phytophthora through its gut and it survives, so we can get a snail coming in that's eaten something that's harmful and then gets released in our environment, poops it out, and now we've got fungus growing on plants that now are attacking it. And that's, mm -hmm. I think it's a real problem, not just fungus, but bacteria as well as other uh, parasites. So eosinophilic angiostrongyliasis, I know it's like a um, tongue full, but this is uh, caused by the nematode, the rat lungworm. Uh, it was first described by Chen in 1935 in rats in Canton, so that's why it's called Cantonensis from Canton. And um, the first record of a uh, human contracting um, this disease was in Taiwan in 1944. So here we have the life cycle of this nematode. Um, it needs two primary hosts to, um, to grow and to develop and to continue the life cycle. First, we have the definitive host, the rats. And uh, we have, um, as you know, three species here. So let me walk you through this circle. So the very top, we'll start with the rat. So it ingests a snail that has um, the third stage worms in its body, okay? So then within the rat, it would penetrate um, through the intestine into the bloodstream into the central nervous system. It goes through the heart, eventually uh, continues to develop and then reaches the lungs, so that, which is why I call the rat lungworm. Because mm -hmm. then the rat uh, coughs up the nematodes and then swallows it so it goes into its tummy, they poop it out, and then snails are decomposers they eat the infected feces, it develops in them to the third stage, and then the rat ingests it, and then the cycle continues. So this is the overall life cycle of this nematode. So again, it needs two hosts, the definitive rat, so it's obligatory to the life cycle. This is where it, um, the larvae mature and reproduce. The intermediate hosts are the snails, so it needs the snail to continue its life cycle. So let's so stop here, I think this is a really important point, is how long have been rats been distributed around the world? Forever, right? Since people started moving out of Africa 100,000 years ago, rats probably went with them. So rats have been everywhere for a long time. 
Why I think we're seeing some of the increases that we're seeing is because not because we're moving rats around still. Rats have been there. We're moving the intermediate host. That key part of the life cycle is what's being moved. Um, and I think that's important to, to think about in terms of how do we control this. And there are other types of hosts, the paratetic host, which is not necessary for the life cycle. Um, the larvae does not mature or reproduce, but it can be a reservoir for these nematodes. And so if it's at a certain stage where the rat eats it because it's dead or um, is decomposing in um, aquatic areas, so you can see the prawn has been recorded to be a paratetic host. You know, we have our kahuku shrimp here, right? Why is it moving? Um, that, uh, yeah, sorry, the slide is moving and I'm not touching anything, it's like magical. So <laughs> anyways, um, so this nematode can infect, um, infect um, these other types of hosts. And then you have the accidental host, which this is also not necessary for the nematode to um, develop. Okay, that is really weird. Yeah, I think it's got timings on it somehow. Uh, it yeah. No, but it didn't do that before when we yeah. practiced. Anyways, um, so this is a dead end where the larvae does not reproduce. Um, it does not n um, know the pathway of the body, so it doesn't go to the lungs or anywhere else, but what it does is it eventually ends up in the brain. And so depending on how many nematodes is ingested, um, it can cause headaches, sickness, and even death. So that's the issue with the accidental host when we accidentally eat it, right? So, um, so when we in, um, ingest, um, a snail that is infected, uh, it penetrates through the intestine and into the bloodstream and it goes straight to the brain. It doesn't go to the lungs or, or anywhere else. And so this is when we have the eosinic um, philic angiostrandulysis. And it's not only for um, Im important to, uh, as a human health perspective, but also as a veterinary important. So pets, zoos, um, there have been records um, of, uh, of other animals like the orangutan, as well as the um, pygmy falcon of actually um, ingesting um, an infected snail and getting sick. On the bottom left are um, images of people who have contracted or got the um, Ne um, nematode and you can see on their eyes that there is some neurological damage and a lot of times it is permanent. And so this is one of those cases where again knowledge about what's going on um, and the, the host of this thing are really important because this is a place that didn't have angiostrongulus before African snails were introduced. Their culture they were used to using a snail that's really large looks a lot like an African snail but it's in a different family Right? And they make ceviche. It's very common for them to have ceviche there with it. But the giant African snail was introduced and they thought, oh, it's the same thing. So they chopped it up and made ceviche with it. And there was a huge outbreak and a lot of people died. Um, and um, more were even left with sort of debilitating motor function problems and neurological problems. So there have been records of this disease um, throughout the world. And um, it's pretty much hit every single continent except for Europe and Antarctica. So I um, just wanted to uh, illustrate that, yes, yeah, not just from Hawaii, from, but from throughout the pan-tropical areas. So with our work, uh, we're not the disease or parasite um, specialist. So we still are dealing with the snails, the intermediate host. So we do have um, a couple of papers out dealing with some of the research that we have with the intermediate host as well as rat lungworm. And so the 2014 paper is one of the more important papers that, um, that we show the different types of snails that can be host to this nematode. And we were also asked from the Department of Health that, you know, are there any uh, commercial washes or household washes that people could use to get rid of snails from their lettuces and basically um, don't be duped there is not no particular magic chemical that's being sold that can get rid of all the snails that that may be on your produce so for this experiment we put um, snails in the very center of the romaine lettuce and the outer leaf and the, on the very um, outside we tested things like salt water vinegar bleach as well as a whole host of other commercial products and basically the best thing was to peel the romaine let lettuce leaf by leaf rinsing it under cold water and and you know making sure all the snails are gone 
And so sometimes uh, some of these uh, washers actually irritates the snail. So what do they do? They hunker down really in the center of the lettuce, so you definitely can't get rid of them. So this is and, a. Hmm? Sorry, I was just going to ask. So yeah. you get rid of the snail itself, and the if there's a slime trail remaining, the slime trail can still have the parasite in it, correct? But it's just a lower uh, load than eating the entire snail body. Yes. Okay. And that's actually one of the problems with using one of these sort of commercially pair, uh, prepared or other washes other than water, is that it irritates the snail. And they emit and they a, just lot produce a lot more slime. mucus, right? And mm, so it actually okay. makes it more difficult to get that off. Whereas cold water just causes the snail to sort of retract and be washed And to off. just slide off. Yep. Yep. But we should say that no one has ever been infected by m mucus alone that we know of. It's always been a question of whether they can be infected by mucus, and we don't know of anyone. But we often don't know how people get infected anyway. We just assume they've consumed some snail. And I suspect, as this slide, next slide will show you, it's probably the case is they're eating a snail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And remember, a lot of these snails may not be detectable by us because a lot of the juveniles are, you know, a couple of millimeters. And if they're hunkered down in the base of the romaine lettuce and you don't peel leaf by leaf, you can start chopping it up, you're pretty much dicing a you know, juvenile snail in the center of your romaine lettuce. So this is um, a graph that we um, published in the 2014 PLOS paper. So um, on the x-axis are the species that we've tested and um, on the y-axis is the percentage um, of specimens that uh, had presence of rat lungworm. So as you can see, yes, Parmar um, martensis, about 70% of the specimens that we tested all had positive for rat lungworm. But you can see a lot of other invasive species as well as a couple of native species um, we recorded with rat lungworm, right? So that's that's one of the important messages that, yeah, we can get rid of Parmar martensi, but that's not going to get rid of rat lungworm cases in Hawaii. and. Parmarian came in the 90s. So one of the first records in Hawaii was in the 60s, right? Um, so it was here prior to, to Parmarian Martensi getting here. And then on the upper right box, just want to see the, you know, show you the parasite load, like how many, um, how much parasites was in a chunk of tissue in these different species. And so Parmarian Martensi does have a higher load every, you know, anywhere from 850 to 340,000. But look at um, they become as alt it. You can go up to the millions. Um, Limax maximus, um, African, and, and the African snail. They also have um, heavy loads of the parasite in the body. And Cyclotropus species. We were, you know, Ken was talking about, you know, when we did these surveys ten years ago. They were found in, you know, several facilities, but in just our very limited but recent. Um, surveys, they're found in a lot, almost all of the sites we um, surveyed. So, you know, maybe we won't be ingesting that, but it's a source for the rats to continue to have the nematode present in a particular area. Can so, I, go ahead. I could have sworn that I saw in the media, maybe this was either um, misrepresented in media articles or I misinterpreted what mm -hmm. I read. But I had thought that the problem with Parmarian martensi was that it had a, a higher uh, density of parasites in it. No. But this is saying the opposite. It's that's just right. that those that species is more likely to have. That's right. So yeah. if you have a hundred Parmarian, sixty-seven of them are probably going to be infected. Whereas if you have a hundred uh, African snails, only about ten of them might be infected in any given area. But okay. again, but, keep in mind yeah. this is a limited survey. So this right. these data are based on the surveys we did for invasive species, that 2004 to 2009 data, that then we decided, well, we'll screen all of that stuff for. We've never actually done a targeted survey specifically looking for rat lungworm, which mm -hmm. might show much higher incidences. And I think the reason this is really important is because the amount of illness, so how sick you get, is dosage dependent. If you get one nematode in you, you probably never even know it. If you get 100, you might get a really bad headache. If you get 300,000, you might die, right? So it, it's dosage dependent. So it's not, we're not trying to say that Parmarian Martensi isn't a problem. It is. We've got to try to control problem. that and understand that. But knowledge gives us the fact that if we remove Parmarian Martensi from a site, what's likely going to happen is you're going to see the infection rates of whatever's left behind go up. 
right? And that's anecdotally, that's what people have seen in other places like Brazil, right? African snail carries in really high levels. Well, there's no Parmari in there. Hmm. So this is um, again based on the uh, screening we did from 2000 um, um, of specimens from 2004 to 2009, and so out of you know about a hundred and um, fifty sites that um, we tested specimens from, 38 were present um, with rat lungworm in the snails, and about 108 were not. So uh, we just um, got some funds uh, with the help of MISC. Um, that is funded by HCF to do uh, a limited um, survey on Maui to go back to some of those uh, red areas to see if we still find snails with rat lungworm but also going into um, additional areas to see if now there is um, you know a, a expanded range that we find rat lungworm so. and so based on those data we did some modeling so you know where are areas that would be quite hospitable for rat lungworm so um, on this it's a color code from from the white all the way to the red the red is it's it's a it's a very good spot for them you can see on Maui, it's, it's in that Haikuhana area, and so recently that's where um, a lot of the more current incidents of rat lungworm detection was of, um, of people contracting it, right? And they so. should make note that this is also a model uh, predicted through 2100, so incorporating climate change models mm -hmm. to look at how they're going to continue to spread. Yeah, so temperature as well as precipitation is a huge factor to um, the spread of habitat suitability for this nematode. So, um, so we're trying to uh, continue to get funds for our ongoing research. Again, you know, the continuum monitoring, uh, you know, we had a huge gap and just coming back to some of the surveys, we are already finding new species um, new island records of species, right? And so a lot of them are rat lungworm um, hosts. And, and so by doing these um, surveys, we're also providing um, the owners some best practice management to help them clean up their um, areas too. Um, but we definitely want to be continue to be identifying, es establishing and understanding um, the spread of invasive land snails in Hawaii, as well as continuing with our screening and assessment of the rat lungworm worm snail hosts. And with that, uh, we have about five minutes left until our brown bag session is up. Any questions? So, so how do you um, check the snails? You extract mucus and look under a microscope and you see the rat longworm or is there a chemical test or how do you test for it? So originally what we did was um, we got we isolated the nematodes from the foot tissue, right? Mm -hmm. And then we did um, genetic analyses to assess um, the, the actual identification of the nematode. Mm -hmm. And so now, um, now that we have vetted that process and, and have a genetic library, we can now do it a little bit more in bulk. So we, it's, it's primarily using PCR mm -hmm. to be assessing whether it's present or not. So we don't do the titers, we don't say, you know, how many um, are in one piece of tissue, right now it's more broadly applicable as in, does this snail have rat lungworm in it or not? Mm -hmm. yeah. and about how long does that process take to uh, um, analyze whether uh, rat lungworm is present or absent within a snail? Mm -hmm. per, per specimen? Or yes, yeah, like per specimen. Just so if we had 10 specimens, um, we got them in and it was sort of like, oh, we need that. We could, it could be done in a week. Less okay. than a week. It can be done okay. in a couple of days. Yeah. Right? So extraction mm -hmm. takes is a six to twelve hour process uh, of DNA. Then the amplification is well, three hours. Day. But it's, it's it's two types of amplification. So no. The ITS. Three, th three three hours to do yeah. that, and then run a gel. So you're looking at two to three days would be the fastest probably. Okay. So given that um, the parasite is an, on all of the main islands and it has a diverse set of hosts, other than consumers washing food that they're about to eat, what is your recommendation for mitigation? Um, well, we, yeah, we had a lot of discussion on how to be controlling this. And, and a lot of times people are like, you know, can we control the rats? 
well, as we know, as conservation managers, it's very difficult to control rats. They're very smart. They can already figure out which bait will kill them very quickly, right? So I know Dave Sisko had to swap from peanut butter to chocolate within months because the rats knew not to go to the peanut butter bait. It's easier to control the snails. So if it's like your residential area and a lot of these low um, habitat, I mean low elevation habitat, it's pretty much trash. You won't see a lot of native snails in your backyard. So I would deploy the mollusca side. That's what I do in my yard in Manoa. When we say mollusca side, we mean iron phosphate, slug yeah. bait. So not metaldehyde, not mm -hmm. I mean, because yeah. that has other problems. So we don't recommend that, but we recommend uh, basically iron phosphate. I mean, it's safe for most things. And, and it's safe for pets out. too. Cause so okay. at, uh, um, at a, um, several stores, they have the pet friendly. Is that sluggo? Yeah, sluggo's yeah. iron phosphate. What's the issue with metaldehyde? Because I think that's pretty widely used. Yeah, it is pretty widely used, but it kills lots of things, right? And it gets into the groundwater and causes all sorts of other problems. Mm -hmm. And it can make animals sick. So you can make your dogs and things sick. Yeah. So, okay. Um, we just generally don't recommend the use of that because we don't know the sort of downstream consequences. Whereas the iron phosphate, from a you know biochemical standpoint, we know that what it does, it won't hurt mammals. You know, you could eat a handful of iron phosphate. It's not going to do anything to you except maybe give you a little bit of stomach ache because of the dehydration issues. And if it gets dumped into fresh water, it's not going to hurt birds. It, it, it may cause a smile algae boom as the iron and phosphate decouple from one another, but that's about it. Okay. Um, so local suppression of the mollusk population where there are people or food being grown, is there also a value to... Um, more treatment and inspection of nursery goods that are moving yeah, between absolutely. islands? Absolutely. I mean, we think that just from an invasive snail standpoint is, is valuable. Um, that should be happening anyway. I mean, we all you know there's more you know difficulty with funding to get these things done. Mm -hmm. um, but because, from yeah, because Parmarian was found on Oahu first, right? And then it ended up on Big Island somehow, right. and now it's on Maui, yeah. right? Yeah. So. It's definitely spreading some way, either horticulturally or agriculturally. Well, we, we, we know that, so from our 2008 paper, where we took all, a lot of the data that we collected from 2004 to 2007 in the horticultural industry, that Oahu at that time was the primary sort of epicenter of all invasive. So basically when you did, we did the analysis, you look at Hawaii was the center of diversity, or Oahu was the center of diversity, right? What we had on Oahu, we had pretty much all 40 some odd invasive species. Right. And then the other islands had subsets with the big island having more than others after Oahu. But now we're starting to see a shift. It seems that big island is starting to pick up, you know, as a port maybe, or I don't know what exactly is going on, but they're getting more and more invasives there now. And so they're starting to catch up with Oahu. And I suspect that's just a matter of transport and where ports are coming in. And so we've been talking with um, Darcy and we talked with uh, HDOA the other day about trying to find some funding to continue surveys and maybe do some pathway analysis to sort of really figure out what is moving these around. I mean, we suspect it's the horticultural industry primarily, but we do know that, you know, like when you go, when, when uh, conservation groups are say building a fence on Maui, they may have the material on Maui for a day or two sitting in the base yard and then they'll take the helicopter and fly it over to Molokai and drop it off on top of the mountain. Um, and that's going to transport snails if something Precautions aren't taken, so it, it, it's multiple pathways. But I think the biggest one is the horticultural industry, mm -hmm. because just moving pots of soil around—I mean, that must move lots of slugs, you know, because that's where they lay their eggs. And is there a effective treatment for the eggs? Hot water. Soil? Hot water. So the problem is, if you get tropical or temperate plants, or some plants are really susceptible to that, that it'll kill some plants, but some of them it, it, it can seem to tolerate it. So there are a couple studies out there that found that they spray hot water on the Christmas trees now, mm -hmm. and they say it doesn't have a great effect. I can't imagine <coughs> it's great for the needles long term, but but it does kill insects. The, it, it, it either kills them or knocks them out off of there. I think it'd probably be pretty detrimental to the eggs, though, because most snails are really susceptible to extreme physiological changes when they're really small. Okay, and the eggs tend to be on the surface of the soil. They don't no, Veronicellids like bury them. Yes. lots of things bury them in the soil. And Veronicellids do this weird thing where they wrap uh, their feces around it and mm. as a protection. It and and then it's, 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 it's hard to even dirt. see them in the dirt. Okay, yeah, you have to dig them up a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. So those. And are then there's the some. Um, I think in Japan or some other areas where they put a whole shipment into a cargo hold and just pump a lot of CO two in it. Yeah, CO2 works too. Yeah. Uh, definitely does. You can <laughs> suffocate okay. everything in there. 
that. And that that's and, really safe for the and plants. And it won't hurt the plants. So. And we know that they do that with transport of produce and things like that a lot of times. They actually sell, we looked into this a few years ago, of like trying to figure out ways to control. Um, and produce can be shipped. There's these companies that put their produce on a, a pallet and they have this sort of plastic box that goes over it and it has a port on it and they pump CO2 into it. And it, it just allows the fruit and stuff to continue ripening while it's sitting on a ship being transported. And that probably wipes out most animals mm -hmm. because they're all, you know, in need of that yeah. oxygen. So rat lungworm has been in Hawaii <coughs> for a while now, but it's just receiving more media attention or why are we, there's more publicity, I guess, around it and the cases. Is there a reason for that? I think it's because one, the number of, as you saw the, our graphs, the number of invasive species, so the things that, that critical intermediate host is more prevalent. So the first case in 1965, we have a whole host of species, like nearly three times as many here established as we did in 1965. That's probably part of it. Um, the other part is that the population's growing and we're encountering it. And there's, <coughs> to be honest with you, one big thing is that um, this, this push for organic. Not that organic's bad, but people have this misconception. They're like, oh, my lettuce is organic. I don't have to wash it. I haven't put any pesticides on it. And so you don't wash off this little tiny translucent one and a half millimeter slug that has you know a few hundred thousand larvae in it. And you just swallow it on down. And and medically, we could, we're, we're also better at diagnosing what it is. And, you know, there has something to be said that, you know, Parmarin is a very good host. You know, um, you know both the disease, as, I mean, the nematode as well as a snail are both from Southeast Asia. And so they could have evolved a very good host parasite relationship. So yeah, all of those are likely factors window. of why we are having an increased detection of rat lungworm in the population. <coughs> But it's also hype. I mean, you know, a, a, a brain-eating worm, right? That that sells newspapers. It sells clicks on a website. A lot of it is hype. I mean, from a percentage-wise perspective, a proportionate, like, how likely are you to get sick from rat worm? Alarm? Super, super, super unlikely. I mean, like, there's so many more things that are threatening your life right now than rat lung worm. I mean, you walk out in the street in Honolulu. If you get on a bicycle, you're probably ten times more likely to die in a car accident than you are to. But this is not to help. say that this is that we should not take this lightly, right? Because no. this is this is a very um, you know, terrible disease, and if, if you do contact it, it's very painful. You can even cause death. So it's not something that says, "Oh yeah, don't care about rat lungworm." We're not no, saying that be, at all. Be precautious, right? Yeah. Be be. I think, like all things, knowledge is is the key to understanding and protecting yourself, right? Don't you know? Let your children go outside and pick up snails and lick them. <laughs> just don't do that. That's probably really dangerous for a variety of reasons. We didn't have rat lungworm. So things like that. I mean, knowing where, what, what carries them and what control measures to take, I think, can eliminate it. But if we do nothing, then we do have a problem because the, the, the disease will continue to spread and humans will encounter it more and more. But not eating local produce is not the solution. No, because yeah. we can get it from other places. So we get stuff imported from, say, Homestead, Florida. Guess what? Florida has rat lungworm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so still buy local, please. <laughs> yep. And lettuce is good for you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone on the phone. Uh, that concludes our brown bag. We'll have another one next month, so stay tuned. Aloha.